It's really exciting. These are topics that I've been thinking about and working on for a long time, you know, for the purpose of improving my own conversation with my own patients. And um, it's very exciting to be here uh, sharing with you. Um, today is also a bit of death by PowerPoint. We're going to go fast and cover a lot of material on diet. Everything you ingest or eat, whether you like it or not, um, we need to be aware of, um, of what we're taking in. Disclosure is not relevant today. This is a very broad informational um, presentation. So there's a lot of ideas and concepts, and that's what we're really trying to communicate. Um, can't guarantee that everything applies specifically to you. Reminder, your health decisions are your own, and, and consult with your, your doctor is um, the most advisable um, advice I can pass on. A lot of people are asking if these slides and presentations are going to be available, and I will make them available. You can watch these talks, um, we'll have handouts. I'm gonna put that on my website. It'll be a few weeks after we're done, but it will be available. Um, if you go there on the internet, you'll have this pop-up which asks you to put in your email address. And if you put in an email address every two weeks, um, email out a, a mailer, um, so you get an email newsletter, and in that I'll say, here's where the presentations are, here's how to access them, hand out notes, you'll get it. So just go to the website, you'll get that pop-up into your email, and if, you, if you would, and, um, and I'll make sure you know exactly how to, ha how to have access to these. So you know, all of our patients and ourselves, we have health and longevity goals, and basically, in my experience, people want to feel good, they want to look good, they want to feel good and look good as long as possible, and we'd all like to avoid the alternatives, which is pain and suffering, loss of function, and um, early death. So, understanding that this is what, where people are coming from, and appropriately so, you know, we really try to help people meet their goals and provide them with feeling well, which comes, of course, from being healthy, looking good, which, of course, comes from being healthy, and to maintain their health and um, their quality of life for as long as we can. And it's an exciting time. The population above age 85 is the fastest growing segment of, of North American population. Um, interestingly, the population over 100 years of age has doubled every decade since the 1950s. And we're still having more and more people reach that centenarian level of, um, of longevity. We know chronic diseases kill people who typically live into their 80s and 90s. Most centenarians, people into their 100s, aren't suffering from chronic diseases. They'll die of pneumonia or general frailty rather than, say, cancer or heart disease. So if we can just sort of get into that super performing range of life, um, you know, it's exciting, and we've dodged most of the bullets that um, disease and our um, society and di dietary pitfalls are, are throwing at us. So more centenarians alive today, and that a trend is expected to continue, at least in, in the upcoming years. Scary, because over two-thirds of Americans today are also overweight or obese. Two-thirds of women, women even three quarters of men, obese to some degree, and obesity drives chronic conditions, including hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, osteoarthritis, some cancers. So people have suggested that we need a collaborative effort, some kind of comprehensive program to get society and people back on track um, so they can avoid chronic illnesses and have a high quality of life. Um, Obesity can advance the aging process by as much as nine years. Um, so it's not a topic to be, to be um, taken lightly. So what do, we in, what do we eat and what do we take into our bodies? Intentionally, we take in fat, protein, and carbohydrates. This is real food. Unintentionally, we're taking in genetically modified organisms. We're eating preservatives, food additives, we're eating pesticides that are on our food, and we're ingesting toxins, lead and mercury that um, industry has put into our water systems and into our food. So intentionally, we're eating to receive nutrition and calories for energy, and unintentionally, we're receiving inflammation and a certain amount of um, toxicity. So we wanna move away from the unintentional ingestions toward, towards the intentional. So eating for health. And the buzzword, if someone wakes you up in the middle of your sleep and says, what should I eat? You should say plant-based, organic, whole food diet. 
You know, that's, if you can sort of keep that as the center unifying um, concept in your mind for how to eat appropriately, those are the words. It's plant-based, meaning most of your diet is coming from plants. It's um, whole foods, meaning it's the entire food just as it was grown. And I'm adding organic because we have to be concerned and interested about how our foods actually grow and are um, presented for us. So a couple of definitions, whole foods. What is a whole food? A whole food is unprocessed, unrefined, or processed and refined as little as possible before it's passed on to you. So in the picture you see whole foods, fruits, vegetables, beans, unpolished grains, just as they grow, that's a whole food. What is an organic food? An organic food is a whole food that was produced without any synthetic pesticides or chemical fertilizers. So it's all, all as natural as possible. There haven't been industrial solvents or chemicals. And what's the consequence of that? Here's an article from the British Journal of Nutrition, 2014, so recent. It says, organic crops on average have higher concentrations of antioxidants, as much as 41% higher, lower concentrations of cadmium, which is a toxic metal, and a fourfold lower incidence of pesticide residues compared to non-organic comparators across regions and across um, production seasons. Uh, so or organic um, production can offer us a significant nutritional advantage as well as remove the chance of us having a number of important toxic exposures. So one consequence of whole foods is that refinement concentrates calories. So when we refine food, any refinement, you have to think you're concentrating calories in that food and the energy content is increasing. So what is refinement? It's kind of any change that you make. Turning a potato into a potato chip, a tomato into tomato paste, apple into apple pie, grains into bread, grapes into raisins, oranges into orange juice. All those, any sort of refining process is gonna concentrate calories and we'll see that. Um, we can as assume roughly the average adult needs a 2,000 calorie per day um, energy requirement. An apple, for example, will have 80 calories. Turn that apple to apple pie, add some cream, you're at 480 calories. It's already a quarter of your daily calorie requirement. Four servings of pie and you're at your daily calorie requirement. You have to eat 24 apples to do the same thing. So. You know, instead of having the second piece of pie, have another 10 apples. You know, and you say, well, that's ridiculous. I can't eat 10 apples. And that's part of the solution is that whole foods, just the work of eating a whole food is substantial and it's quite an investment. So if it, that's natural resistance for you taking in too many calories is it takes an effort to um, eat apples or whole foods. But let's understand how that refining process has concentrated calories. And if you take it in, your body has two choices, burn it or store it. And if you're not burning it, you'll store it. And that's how we get obese. So we'll take a baked potato, 120 calories, add sour cream and butter, we're up to 390 calories, make french fries, 450 calories, and make potato chips and we're at 1,000 calories. Already half of your daily um, calorie requirement um, in the form of potato chips. How about a nice fresh glass of orange juice? It's about equivalent to a can of Coke. Here we see beverages, Pepsi, Sprite, Coca-Cola Classic, Gatorade, 100 calories per eight ounce serving, and the equivalent of grape juice, pineapple juice, cranberry juice, apple juice, orange juice, in fact, higher in their total calorie content. So most fruit juices, most fruit juices, unless you squeezed it yourself, is concentrated sugar water that tastes like the fruit um, that it came from. So be aware of that. Um, and how costly those are to your daily calorie count. So encourage everyone to eat whole foods as closely as possible. Recognize it the way it came out of the garden and do your best to eat it in that form and you're well on your way to success. So what is a calorie? It's energy to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's a nice scientific definition. 1,600 calories a day for older adults, people who are sedentary, up to 2,800 for, say, a teenage boy or a very active adult. Roughly 2,000 per day is, is what we need, and we think calories equals weight gain. You know, whatever you don't, um, 
burn, you store. So if your calorie intake is exceeding what you burn, you gain weight. If what you burn exceeds what you intake, you lose weight. That's a nice simplifying concept. It's a good starting place. It's not entirely true. Um, because calories, in fact, in your body is a nonlinear science. A calorie is not a calorie. Effective calories for you, which differs for everyone, is what's important. Some foods you eat are going to rev up your metabolism or wind it down so you'll burn hotter or not. Foods are going to impact your DNA, change how your body responds to the food itself, and it's going to switch hormones on and off, which is going to affect your digestion and metabolism. So the calorie label on the food is a great starting point, not entirely reliable to predict how that food is going to respond in your body. So just be aware. So for each person, a calorie is uh, simply not a calorie. A cup of Fruit Loop cereal and one tablespoon of peanut butter have about the same calories. Um, the Fruit Loops will slow your metabolism. The peanut butter will speed up your metabolism. And again, that in turn will translate into whether you gain weight or lose weight in response to eating that. People eating nuts, for example, lose weight because nuts take so much work for your body to digest. Extremely healthy, but we need to be aware of these things in planning our calorie intake and predicting how our body is going to um, respond to those. So some reasons why you shouldn't count calories is it's really your gut flora that's going to determine if your calorie is absorbed or not. So what you put down the hatch isn't necessarily what your body is going to absorb into your system. It's your bacteria in many ways that are going to determine that, and that's a little bit different for everybody. Think that processing and even cooking unlocks calories. So the calories you will receive from a certain piece of food will change depending on whether that's processed or even cooked. And then ultimately, it's our hunger hormones, the ghrelins and leptins in our system, that determine um, how much we eat. Because when those are raging, um, your efforts to resist them are going to be essentially futile. So what are those hormones? Your brain is actually quite a passive bystander in this process. Ghrelin is produced from your stomach, tells your brain to increase hunger. Leptin, which is stored in your fat stores, tells your brain to decrease hunger. So before you eat, ghrelins are high and you're hungry, leptins are low, and after eating, that balance effectively um, reverses. The ghrelins are low and the leptins are high, indicating that you are, that you are sati satiated. Um, there are foods that will increase your metabolism and calorie burn, which are going to resist uh, you gaining weight. Fiber, proteins, even regularly timed meals, drinking water, drinking water to increase your um, metabolism and burn calories, having muscle mass, having exercise, living in hot or cold weather. So we're fortunate here in Canada that we get both hot and cold weather and recognize that that's going to increase your calorie burn more than just living at room temperature. Decreasing your metabolism is sugar. So just as you're loaded with calories, your metabolism is turning down such that that energy that you've received has to be stored rather than instantly burned. And that'll also be true for refined grains. So for food, our only options, really the only thing we can eat that will possibly benefit us is a combination of fat, proteins, and carbs. So we should understand those just a little bit better, starting with fat, and this is brand new, 2015 guidelines released literally months ago. In the past, 2005, 2010 guidelines said, limit your total fat to 20 to 35% of your total calories and don't eat more than 300 milligrams of cholesterol a day. 2015 guidelines have said, there's no health benefit to limiting the amount of total fat in your diet. Furthermore, cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. So the guidelines have backed off fat, this previously vilified nutrient, giving it a reprieve of sorts. The chairman of that committee kind of makes this statement, which puts it in perspective a little bit. She says, consumers will find you can only have a certain amount of fat if you're abiding by all the other dietary guidelines for fruits and vegetables. So it's not like the sky's the limit most people will probably arrive at a natural limit of 32 to 34 percent of their daily calories being in the form of fat if you're also following other healthy dietary patterns. So we should expect that our fat intake falls in the 30 percent to 34 percent range of our total calorie intake and rather than trying to reduce that even lower and beat it down, we should switch our focus to really high quality fats that are serving our bodies 
tremendously well and lowering the endogenous cholesterol that our own bodies are producing, lowering our serum cholesterols, again, by um, taking in certain fats, and we'll see how that works. So types of fats, we have saturated fats. Those are mostly in animal products, at least they're natural. The best fats for you, these monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. So olives, avocados, and a lot of vegetable oils will include those monos and those polys. In the polys, we see those elusive omega-3s. So good for us. Omega-3 is a polyunsaturated fatty acid, most concentrated in fish oil, also available in flaxseed and walnuts for all of um, us vegetarians. Trans fats are manufactured and synthetic. They are severely cardiotoxic. They are illegal in most countries and will be in the United States by 2018. So these shouldn't be available to us um, much longer, but we have to absolutely avoid them. So the good fats, the good fats, nuts, polyunsaturated, your choice is walnut, highest concentration of omega-3 of any nut. Everyone's diet should include walnuts. Monounsaturated, other nut friends, almonds and peanuts, avocados and olive oil, we have to deliberately include these things um, in our diets. Back on the polys, we have a number of seeds, sunflower, sesame, pumpkin, flax seed, soya bean, and the fatty fish um, that we talked about yesterday, salmon, tuna, trout. The smaller the fish, the better, because the fatty acids are really concentrated, and that fish hasn't had the chance to absorb um, toxin that's, toxins that some of its larger um, friends will have absorbed. So another word on omega-3 fatty acids. Who's heard that omega-3 fatty acids are good for you? It's a buzzword. We all know that omega-3s are good. It's a polyunsaturated fatty acid. How can we get, make this practical? Let's recognize 60% of our brains are fat. 8% of that is DHA, a form of omega-3. That's an omega-3 fat, and it's what really predominates in fish oil, interestingly. So omega-3s are important for heart and for brain, cognitive function, emotional health, stroke, cancer, arthritis, joint pain, improving inflammation, the omega-3s are super important. And we have to realize that we can't synthesize omega-3s. Your body can't make them. So you have to eat them, and you have to be deliberate about how you eat them. We said fish oil is your most concentrated source. Vegetarians, including myself, like to avoid um, fish if we can. Best vegetarian sources then are flaxseed, walnuts, even, I'll put in brackets, canola oil, because it is, in fact, high in, omega th in omega-3s and omegas, but um, there's some reasons why you may want to avoid some of these oils. Uh, so flaxseed and walnuts, something we should really um, pre um, pursue quite deliberately. Not the EPA DHA, EPA DHA concentrations of fish oil, but there is some, and your body can convert it, and um, these need to be very deliberately placed in our, in our diets. Again, the trans fats, bad. Anything that says partially hydrogenated is absolutely, um, absolutely un, um, unacceptable. So don't even go there. Trans fats show up in crackers, cookies, donuts, french fries, stick margarine, shortening, um, gives stability and shelf life to the product. It's for the manufacturers to benefit from, not from you, so let's avoid it. Again, it'll be out of the United States by 2018. Cholesterol. Cholesterol is a fat. It's simply a fat. It's made by animal cells. Plants don't contain any cholesterol. So if you are a vegetarian, you've, you're already not eating any cholesterol. So that's good news. So then where will you get cholesterol? Your body will manufacture cholesterol. Well, how much cholesterol will your body manufacture? Partly depends on your genetics, and genetics aren't entirely static, they can change. And it also depends on what other foods you're eating will control how much cholesterol your liver is producing and supplying to your bloodstream. So we should just be aware of this. Um, it's important for the integrity of the membranes of our cells, so cholesterol plays a vital role, and also for um, certain hormones, vitamin D, bile, things that your body needs and uses all the time. So it's not entirely bad. We need to be on top of it and aware of it and um, control it appropriately. So again, your cholesterol level mainly represents the cholesterol that your body has synthesized. This is determined by the other foods, mainly fats, that you eat, 
and also on your genetics. And your genetics aren't entirely fixed in stone. They change as your diet changes and conditions in your body um, evolve over time. Um, so we should focus on how we can influence this with foods. Again, those two foods that we said are so great for us, the monounsaturated, the polyunsaturated, lowers LDL cholesterol, both of them, that's the bad cholesterol, raises HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, and lowers triglycerides, which are fat stores in your bloodstream. So both the monos and the polys, which are other fats, are gonna shift your cholesterol production in your body towards the more beneficial and advantageous, advantageous forms. So of that 30% energy that we're going to be getting from our fats, we want that to be coming from the monos and polys, um, really as much as we can. And here's a, here's a study that came out um, very recently from the American Heart Association, January of this year. They studied 45 healthy but um, overweight and obese individuals aged 21 to 70, and the study was your fat diet has to include one Haas avocado per day. And on average, that lowered cholesterol by 13.5 points, you know, helping people attain a cholesterol goal of 100 or maybe even 70. So that's sort of 10% of your total serum cholesterol goes down in the presence of that avocado diet. Because of the um, monounsaturated fats, also tons of antioxidants, vitamins, potassium, how much calories in an avocado? About 300. So the suggestion was perhaps half an avocado daily, eat it as a salad, and that's an excellent source of the monounsaturated fats that's gonna shift your own cholesterol um, in the beneficial direction. Almonds, or sorry, four nuts. I think almonds and walnuts are the backbone of your nut, reg of your nut um, regimen. Other nuts, pistachios, even peanuts, not officially a nut, can lower diabetes risk and heart um, disease risk uh, considerably. So a mixed collection of nuts, small handful daily or several times a week, should include um, you know, walnuts and almonds, and that's going to be part of our staple. We talked about inflammation yesterday as an organizing theme that we're going to use to Im um, improve, our, improve our health, you know, a, a single goal of minimizing inflammation. So what are fat sources of inflammation? The saturated fats, mainly from animal products, the trans fats, which are manufactured, and the omega-6s, that polyunsaturated fat. We want the omega-3s. We also need a certain amount of omega-6s. The ideal ratio is about 1 to 1, 2 to 1. The Western diet is on average 30 to 1. So oils like corn, safflower, sunflower, grapeseed. Someone asked me about grapeseed yesterday. They're very high in omega-6s and that's tipping that omega balance away from what we'd like. Processed foods are loaded with omega-6s, so we want to deliberately increase that omega-3 ratio and realize that the omega-6s are contributing to, to our inflammatory state. So again, fats causing inflammation, trans-saturated, and, um, and the omegas. So let's go on to, to protein. What has more protein, a porterhouse steak or a cup of lentils? The steak has more protein. It's the collateral damage, 38 grams of fat that will come with your steak. Contrast lentils, 18 grams of protein, about half, still quite a bit, but look at that, less than one gram of fat. So the collateral damage from eating lentils, almost nil. So it becomes this excellent source. What are proteins? They're made of amino acid molecules. They're collections of these guys, 23 of them. Eight of them are essential. Your body can't manufacture them, so you have to eat them. Um, vegetarians have to realize that plants are not complete protein, so you have to eat different types of plants to make a complete protein. You don't have to do it at the same time. Your body will sort it out later as long as you're drawing from different um, plant groups. You're mixing legumes complement you with grains or legumes complement you with nuts and seeds. You're drawing from both of those kind of at different times as you move forward and you'll provide your body with plenty of um, complete protein. Is soy good for us? Soy is a vegetable. Who says soy is healthful? We have some soy believers. You're cautious because you know I'm baiting. Um, soy is wonderful raw soy, natural soy, um, high-tech processing methods have created toxic and cancer-causing residues in highly processed soy. 
Soy byproducts from manufacturing processes are used for your food, used for cattle feed, and they are not healthy. They get the label of soy, and soy triggers in your brain that it's healthy. We have to be very, very careful in the, in the business of soy. The upside is that a natural soy, especially through fermentation, is really created to, into a very powerful health food. So we think of foods like tempeh, miso, natto, soybean sprouts. These are excellent. We become worried about products containing highly processed soy, and you'll see that on your food level labels. Um, and this is often soy milk or vegetarian burger patties or in ice creams, things like this where you see soy on the label. This is a very unhealthy form of soy. Um, so a good vegetarian source, source of soy, of course it's vegetarian, but what is a healthy source of soy? How about tempeh? This is a fermented plant-based protein, nutty mushroom flavor. It's partially cooked, minima, minimally processed soybeans that is then fermented overnight. Very excellent um, source of soy. We'll be aware, and we'll talk about it later, most soy that's available to us is genetically modified. That isn't necessarily bad, but we'll um, be aware of that. And in the meantime, we'll appreciate the benefits of tempeh as an excellent form of soy that is in fact very good for you. Excellent source of probiotics as a result of that fermentation step. You know, recolonize the good bacteria, help to neutralize the bad bacteria. It's a complete source of protein. 16 grams of protein per serving, you know, really phenomenal. Excellent source of vitamin and minerals. So for healthy, vet, for healthy um, vegetable protein, um, allowing reduced meat consumption, tempeh really is um, a no-brainer and something we should consider eating as part of our vegetable protein um, regimen and also as a, an important source of our probiotics. If we look at protein, you know, it's, it's, it, it's no kidding that most of the highest concentrated sources are in meat, but we do have significant vegetarian options. For those dairy options, the ones that I favor are cottage cheese or a very high quality Greek yogurt. Again, also as a, as a source of um, probiotics. A half a cup of low fat cottage cheese contained 14 grams of, um, of protein. Ounce for ounce, more protein than milk in, um, in cottage cheese. Regular cheese and eggs rank high. There's other reasons to be cautious about those, so I don't um, advocate eating either of those to increase your, your protein content. Surprisingly, and we've already said soya beans, an excellent source of protein, 14 grams per half cup. Contrast that to pinto beans or kidney beans where you're only getting eight grams of protein for the same serving. And very surprisingly, pumpkin seeds. A serving of pumpkin seeds is over eight grams of protein, for, um, of, um, protein per ounce. Almost double that of walnuts, almonds, or sunflowers. So we can seek pro, um, pumpkin seeds as an important source, vegetable source of, of proteins. And then, quin, um, I've said this wrong several times, quinoa is an excellent source of protein. Um, cook quinoa, eight grams of protein in a serving. Um, really fantastic and available more and more in our grocery stores. Protein sources of inflammation. We want to avoid inflammation. We talked about that extensively the other day. Casein protein is a common allergy in dairy and wheat protein. Um, you can buy it to help you build muscles, and it will help you build muscles. Let's remember that it's inflammatory, and there's a certain destructive component um, throughout our bodies. And then again, whole milk and 2% milk. Um, most people have some difficulty digesting milk. Too much milk can trigger inflammation. Anything 2% or higher is going to have that inflammatory effect. So we want a moderate intake of a low-fat dairy product. It can actually protect against inflammation, give you most of the advantages nutritionally um, that are available in milk. So we have to go low-fat, skim, and um, you know, really, avoid, really avoid, say, casein. Um, you know, just moving quickly, because this, this, is, this is important too. Simple carbohydrates are simple sugars, readily available. Burn it or store it now makes it very dangerous. As you get into a more complex starch, the sugar molecules get bigger. It takes more time to break down and digest. You get a more sustained energy burn. And when that molecule is so complex, your body can't break it down at all, and that becomes fiber. 
And fiber is important to us um, for reasons that we'll say. So again, high glycemic index carbs are ones that we can burn very quickly, and the low glycemic index are the ones with more of a sustained burn, give you energy throughout our day. And we want to choose the carbs that are more of a low glycemic um, index type of formulation. The rule to remember is simple carbs, you die early, complex carbs, you live long. Um, it really does become that simple. And let's be aware of the sugar, the simple carb, that is everywhere. Um, in our soft drinks, in our orange juices, Snapple, which you might think is good for you, tomato sauce, salad dressing, ketchup, processed sugar is absolutely everywhere. More on your drinks in, in terms of their sugar content. It is staggering how much sugar we are taking in. In fact, by the, average, by the time the average child in a developed country turns eight years old, they will have consumed more sugar than the average person did in their entire lifetime just one century ago. And let's remember, it was the people who were born a century ago who are turning 100 now, okay? So they, despite all the diseases and maybe poor nutrition that they may have been exposed to, they didn't have sugar in front of them and they weren't being pumped full of sugar and that may be an important part of the difference. Average American, 160 pounds a year, that's often high fructose corn syrup, um, your body is designed for just very small amounts of sugar and has a hard time coping with that large sugar rush. So you get the sugar road that gives you insulin release. Sugar goes into your cells. It's quickly transformed into fat, a dense storage form of energy. Then you repeat that sugar load, and now there's insulin resistance. Your cells say, we're not taking any more sugar. We're engorged with sugar. So now the sugar stays in your bloodstream and the high insulin levels stay in your bloodstream and both of those are inflammatory. So they wreak havoc on your bloodstream and your blood vessels and predispose you to atherosclerosis. So sugar is extremely toxic. Most scientists and health professionals say if they could eliminate one thing to help the um, population at large, it would be refined uh, sugars. So do yourself the favor and um, eliminate it from your diet. We can have sweet agave syrup, stevia, um, excellent natural sweeteners, um, which are um, really not toxic and allow us to, to enjoy sweetness. Whole grains, whole grains, it has to contain every part of the grain. When something is labeled whole grains, that, mean, that means it does contain all three parts of the grain and that's what you want. In contrast, whole wheat, it may be all wheat, but that's not the whole part of the wheat kernel. It's mostly the junk part of the wheat kernel. And to eat that is not giving you a complete diet and it's misleading because you think you're getting a complex carbohydrate when you're not. Same thing for 100% wheat. That label doesn't guarantee you anything. It has to say whole grain um, for you to have that true complex carbohydrate that you'll benefit from. And fortunately, these things are out there. We just have to know what they are. So high fiber cereal eaters, high fiber cereal eaters, you know, publication from this year, 34% lower risk of death from diabetes, 15% reduced risk of death from cancer, 17% lower risk of all cause mortality. So ingredients to a long life are in your cereal bowl. And we have to be aware, what are good cereals? These are in fact good cereals, at least by today's formulation. One fiber, go lean, even frosted mini wheats. Honey Bunches, even Cheerios, Quaker Oats, all of those, in fact, um, are excellent sources of cereal, which we have seen really can be um, life prolonging if we only knew to eat them and took the time to distinguish good from bad. Can I still eat bread? People worry about bread. You can eat bread. There's some excellent sources of bread out there. This is um, my favorite. It's available in our, in, our, in our grocery stores in Washington. And it's really inspired by a Bible verse that said, take wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and spelt, which is an ancient grain, put them in one vessel and make bread. And that's the philosophy behind Ezekiel bread. And it is a no flour, whole grain, organic bread, contains wheat, rye, barley, millet, lentils, northern beans, kidney beans, pinto beans, complete nutrition, complete protein, all the amino acids, and um, you can taste the quality. And that's a bread that um, I've come to appreciate. There are others, um, that's the one I'm most familiar with. So carbohydrates is a source of inflammation, things we wanna run from. Simple sugars, refined carbohydrates, 
gluten. Gluten's a problem for many people. It's a common allergen and it promotes inflammation in people who don't tolerate it well. You may just want to try to avoid completely. I'll put in here, it's actually not a carbohydrate, but it's a fake sweetener, aspartame over um, intense artificial um, sweetener. It's actually a neurotoxin for its effects on the brain, very sensitive to the inflammatory response. We have to become masters of food labels, look for it, and, and, um, and refuse to have anything to do with it. So we avoid sources of inflammation arising from the foods that we are trying to eat. Um, so we're touching on a lot of things, but what do we eat? Give me a guiding, unifying principle. And um, the diet that's been studied and that has journal articles and a large body of literature in support of it um, for its positive health effects is what is commonly called a Mediterranean diet. And this really is a plant-based and whole food diet. So what I, with patients looking for dietary advice, I push them towards um, what's described as a, as, a, as a Mediterranean diet. When it's done properly, consistently demonstrated to decrease your overall mortality or chance of dying, it reduces chronic diseases, reduces major cardiovascular diseases, and it promotes healthy aging. So if we could get most people to adhere to a Mediterranean-type diet, um, we'd be a long way ahead. And this is actually the note that I put together if a patient says, I am interested in dietary advice, and I ask everybody, I copy this into their electronic medical record, and we print it for them as they go out the door, and I say, if you want to improve your diet to improve your health, your cardiac health, follow this, and you'll be um, a long way ahead. It's very interesting. So five servings of fruits and vegetables daily. Choose organic whenever possible. Eat a small handful of mixed nuts daily, preferably at breakfast. A mixed nut that should include a Brazil nut, because they're all going to include either an almond or a walnut. Brazil nut for the mineral selenium. Suggest to eat two tablespoons of high quality extra virgin olive oil, preferably in the morning. And use that to reduce your hunger cravings during the day in substitution for snack foods. Eat two to three servings of fermented food per week, like a sauerkraut or a natto of fermented soy. The Mediterranean diet does encourage moderately high intake of fish. And a lot of our patients, of course, are not vegetarians, and so it's a nice outlet for them. But they need to be directed towards um, what can benefit them. That's a high-quality Pacific salmon or those little fatty fish like mackerels and herrings and lake trouts and sardines. You know, that's a good source of omega-3, and it's a nice out for the people who aren't ready to, um, to be um, vegetarian. Low intake of dairy, meat, and poultry prioritize skim milk, cottage cheese, and Greek yogurt. People don't know these things, but for most people, that's a big change in the direction of health. Only whole grain bread, and for our community, I'll say I suggest Ezekiel bread. It's available in some of our local grocery stores. Snack on fruit, dried fruit, unsalted nuts, not cakes and biscuits and processed foods. Avoid any highly processed fast food or ready meal. Drink filtered water, no pop, no carbonated beverage, no fruit juice, no distilled water. Say recommend not to drink alcohol, though a Mediterranean diet does allow for red wine. Um, any alcohol consumption in moderation, four drinks per men, two drinks for women, and that's tight by any alcohol recommendation. Uh, so I think it's a move in a good direction and for those people only red wine. So don't drink alcohol. Many of our patients do. You're not going to change that overnight. So tell them the right servings and the right sources, and it's going to shift them um, nicely in the direction of health. So just a couple of highlights. Um, a Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil. That's a highlight of the diet. Reduced major cardiovascular events in patients with a known history of heart disease. So you have heart disease. Ex, you know, the extra virgin olive oil does move, move you in the right direction. Nuts, several handfuls per week. It prevents heart disease, it helps with weight loss, and it pr promotes satiety, so you're not hungry and reaching for other unhealthy foods later. We said walnuts, highest in omega-3. It creates your serotonin or feel-good hormone, so you're actually going to feel better and your brain will be happier with a natural um, mood regulator. 
beans, excellent sources of proteins. They'll fill you up. The more you eat, the more you lose weight. You build muscle that helps um, digest fat. Blueberries are a superfood. They fight cancer. They lower cholesterol. That's true of all berries. Buying them frozen in the winter is just fine. Uh, people need to know and reach for that. Um, if you're going to eat meat, salmon, uh, true Pacific salmon or Atlantic or um, Alaskan salmon is, is your best source. And that high dose of omega-3 is going to reduce inflammation and slow the buildup of atherosclerotic plaque um, in your arteries. Uh, quinoa, large protein concentrate for a grain. Spinach and broccoli, just super energy dense, giving you energy, giving you um, endurance, curbing hunger. Um, really things to emphasize to people. And I'll put this slide in because the Mediterranean diet does say we can have, or that um, it's acceptable to drink red wine. It's actually associated with longevity in a number of studies. Um, and that may be due to the resveratrol content of the grape. It might be due to some of the culture because people who are wine drinkers will often relax and visit and socialize and those things are good. Um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about alcohol and my recommendation is to anybody is, um, is, is abstinence. Good studies, solid research, top journals, supplementing with extra virgin olive oil and nuts. Reduction in heart attack, stroke, or death over a five-year interval, 30% in the extra virgin olive oil group, 28% in the supplemental nuts group, two and a half tablespoons per day of the extra virgin olive oil, lowering blood pressure, giving you an immediate cardiac effect. If you, you have to have some fat, and you have to get it from somewhere, and these are the sources that are just proven to be um, beneficial. So Mediterranean diet linked to longer telomeres. And this is interesting. What is a telomere? It's your DNA. It's the ends of your DNA. It's like the, the bookends. Um, every time your cells reproduce, the, the, the telomeres shorten, and that's a sign of DNA aging. And eventually it starts to encroach and compromise the quality of your own genetic material. How are you supposed to survive and thrive when your own genetic material is compromised? And every time your cell reproduces, it's doing a worse and worse job. So we have a Mediterranean diet linked to longer telomeres, longer bookends. Your cells will divide more times before they ever become compromised from a genetic point of view. And the Mediterranean diet has been shown to increase the length on average of telomeres. So in the spirit of full disclosure, and I took these pictures for you, um, my morning right now is starting out with a handful of mixed nuts and a tablespoon of a very high quality extra virgin olive oil. Um, you drink water in the morning, halfway through your glass of water, take your nuts, take your tablespoon of olive oil, throw it all down the hatch, finish your, finish your glass of water, go to the hospital, have a bowl of oatmeal, add some cinnamon to improve your glucose control and because they put it out for you, and every so often a high quality um, Greek yogurt for that, um, um, you know, for, those, for that probiotic effect. I really um, feel at this moment that fits into my um, regimen and my schedule and um, is benefiting in the direction of health. There are studies showing soda and sugar sh um, shortens the length of your telomeres. It's degrading your DNA, among other things, and this should be motivating to us. A daily 20-ounce soda is 4.6 years of telomere shortening. It's an effect comparable to smoking. We simply have to eliminate um, simple sugars from our diet. It is absolutely toxic. I said I'd say a little bit more about alcohol. Alcohol demands your body's immediate attention. If someone drinks a glass of alcohol, all processes shut down. We have to metabolize that because it's toxic. So you're postponing other important processes while you put a stress on, um, on your liver. Your body can't store it, it has to process immediately and shifts everything to work on that. Abusing alcohol causes bacteria to grow in your gut those could migrate into your GI wall. This is bacteria you don't want and um, cause damage. Too much is bad for your heart. Cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, high blood pressure. We see alcohol-induced cardiomyopathies and, and arrhythmias in our, in our um, clinics frequently and um, the effect is very real. Can develop pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas as you're trying to digest these things. Too much puts you at risk for some cancers mouth, esophagus, throat, liver, breast cancer. 
with alcohol and it affects your immune system, weakens your immune system, makes you more susceptible to infections. Alcohol drinkers have more colds, flus, and other illnesses. So, you know, abstinence is the recommendation um, for those who aren't gonna change overnight. Um, you know, a Mediterranean diet does give you that allowance and we really encourage those people to reduce your intake and make it a high quality uh, red wine if you're gonna do it. If you're feeling overwhelmed, we can go back to that simple principle. Plant-based, whole food, simplifies everything. These are the trimmest, healthiest people on the planet. Eat more plants, consume more fiber, lose more weights. Don't bother counting your calories. You don't have to measure your portions too closely. You don't necessarily have to exercise more. If you can just stick to that plant-based regimen, so many things will just fall into line um, very simply. You know, and here's a 66-year-old woman, lots of kids, trains Dobermans, gained 10 pounds in the last 30, um, 30 pounds in the last 10 years on a typical American diet, drinking more alcohol than she knew was good for her, ate raw foods strictly for 21 days, lost 10 pounds, lost the craving for sweets and salty food, started walking again, walking several miles, never sweat before, now sweating in a healthful way, dreaming, indicating a deeper sleep, fibromyalgia has resolved, skin looks glowing. You know, a thrilling result on 21 days of just sticking to the principles that um, we've discussed today, you can really truly start to see um, your body transform or improve. Those of us who are already doing these things, there's always room to tweak and improve. And uh, let's take it seriously. There's um, no opportunity like the present. And fortunately, the most nutrient dense fruits and vegetables have all been quantified for us. You know, based on 17 nutrients, we know that these are the most packed. So if you wanna know which are gonna give you the most bang for your buck and constantly be putting those on your plate, here is your list, you know, and it really boils down to cruciferous, watercress, Chinese cabbage. Who knew those were the most dense? Um, beet greens, spinach, chicory, parsley. Um, we have our pumpkins and carrots, strawberries, lemons, a citrus fruit, many citrus fruits, berries, you know, it has been quantified, the charts are available. Look over the slide, insert these things into your diet because they are the most nutrient dense. Foods to boost your brain power. All my patients complain that they're losing their memory or the thoughts are becoming um, crowdy, cloudy. There are ways to do this. Whole grains improves concentration and focus because it's that steady supply of glucose throughout your day um, that we need to concentrate. Um, um, those fatty fish oils we've talked about with good vegetarian options, you know, beneficial for preventing Alzheimer's and memory loss. Binge on blueberries, binge on them. And I know they're so popular here in the Fraser Valley, improve short-term memory loss. And this is a subject of study, particularly at Tufts University in um, Boston. Tomatoes, like, um, uniquely include lycopene, very powerful antioxidant, protecting against free radical, free radical damage for dementia and Alzheimer's. You know, eat tomatoes deliberately for their um, content of lycopene. Your B6 vitamins improve cognitive impairment, prevent Alzheimer's. Vitamin C from black currants, mental agility, strong anti-inflammatory properties. We need to seek these out, eat them on purpose. Pumpkin seeds have zinc. You didn't know that till today. I did, didn't either until recently. Very beneficial for your memory, for your thinking skills. Um, broccoli, excellent source of vitamin K for cognitive function and brain power. Sprinkle on sage. A sage memory is almost synonymous with an excellent memory. It does improve memory. It's often a, a, an essential oil. And go nuts. Again, vitamin E. We've learned from studies that vitamin E supplements don't seem to benefit, but a natural form of vitamin E is a wonderful antioxidant preventing cognitive decline, particularly in, in the elderly. So we seek out natural sources of vitamin E and we eat them deliberately. Foods to lower cancer risk. I have significant cancer risk, partly come from my job exposure, and I think all of us do from uh, many of the toxic exposures that modern life exposes us to. I wanna be fighting it at all times and know that I'm doing it. So the American Cancer Society says five servings of fruits and vegetables, but some are particularly useful. What are those? Garlic blocks cancer cell replication, includes an active ingredient, allicin, very good for your 
cholesterol profile, one clove per day, you know, do it deliberately. We can do this deliberately. Berries, berries of all sorts are good for their uh, very powerful antioxidant properties. Tomatoes, like I said, with lycopene, very good for prostate cancer. Lycopene is better absorbed when your um, tomato is in the form of a tomato sauce. So go ahead and make tomato sauces, eat them deliberately and celebrate what you're doing. Cruciferous vegetables, protects DNA from free radical damage, it really does. Slows tumor growth, encourages cancer cells to die. So we put these things in our diet for their dense nutritional value and because they're protecting us from chronic diseases which are gonna limit the longevity of so many people around us, possibly even ourselves. Green tea protects DNA, shrinks tumors. Anti-cancer diet, whole grains, particularly for colorectal cancer. So again, we eat these things deliberately. A spice, turmeric. It's a staple in Indian curries. Shrinks tumors in animals. Inhibits certain cancer cells, slows cancer spread. Recommended that you choose this and deliberately use it as one of your spices. Leafy green vegetables, limits the growth of certain cancers. Strong antioxidant beta carotene, which is a vitamin A. Studies have shown supplementing with, vitamin, with beta carotene in a synthetic form is not beneficial. But the strong beneficial effect from having that vitamin in its natural form, so we seek it out. You know, when you see it being so good in the natural form, then someone's going to study, hey, can we do the same thing with a supplement? Several of those have been surprisingly disappointing, just putting the emphasis on these dietary sources. Grapes, the strong antioxidant resveratrol. Um, it's in the skin of red grapes. It's also in the seeds, so eat the seeds of your grapes. Linked to lower prostate cancer. Beans also reduce cancer risk. Um, pinto, pinto beans and red kidney beans are excellent. Uh, they're always in our salad bar at work, and I deliberately put them on my plate for their anti-cancer benefit. Here's an interesting one, kind of something exotic. Bitter melon, shown to be effective in treating diabetes. Diabetes, being a disease of your pancreas, being a precursor to pancreatic cancer, which is almost always discovered when it's stage four and metastatic, and it's too late. This is what took um, Steve Jobs. Um, there are natural substances that we can be eating that are protecting us from these things. Okay, so inadvertent ingestions, inadvertent ingestions and exposures. In addition to what you're trying to eat, or what you at least know you should be eating, what else are you eating? And what else is getting inside of you? This is kind of concerning, genetically modified organisms, pesticides, food additives, and environmental toxins. So not only do we seek what we need, we have to actively avoid um, what is harmful to us. That said, is a, is a genetically modified plant necessarily harmful? Scientific consensus really is no, so let's not create an artificial scare, but I think this is something that we need to be aware of, and there are some important consequences. So genetically modified organism is anything where a scientist has changed the genes to manipulate the organism to increase some beneficial property. So here's a glowfish. It glows and it was sold as a pet. The first genetically modified animal sold as a pet because it's so colorful, it's nice to look at. But uh, recognize that that's not entirely um, natural. Main GMO crops, soybean, maize or corn, rapeseed, cotton. Those are the big four. Let's take this one for example. Genetically modified corn. Stack traits for insect resistance and herbicide tolerance. So now the plant is fighting the bugs and allowing the farmers to use higher doses of herbicides to protect it from bugs. Consequence to you is that the corn that shows up, you may need to wash a little bit harder because the pesticide residues on it are going to be higher. If that was our only problem, we could probably deal with it. Um, genetically modified cotton, for example. This BT toxin actually protects against insects and pests. So that's wonderful. It's allowed for dr drastic reductions in pesticide use in your cotton. So cotton products that you are exposed to, and it shows up in many food additives, um, hopefully had less toxin exposure and um, less that you're exposed to. So that's wonderful.
Um, here's some Canadian pride. What about rapeseed oil or canola? Canola stands for Canadian oil because it was developed in Canada. It's actually um, has a lot of potential because it's high in monounsaturated fats. So we think maybe this is going to turn out to be healthy. What changes were made? Changes to eliminate the bitter taste and changes to eliminate certain toxins which prohibited its use as a farm feed. Now there's multiple uses. In animal feed where it's used mostly, in emulsifiers, vitamins, a lot of industrial applications. It's not yet growing in Europe, but it is here. It's on our table. It's um, ubiquitous, and there is a potential health benefit. Soybeans, modified for herbicide resistance, allows us to use more herbicides, which may get translated to you. U.S., 85%, Argentina, 98% of, of um, soybeans that you um, can buy are genetically modified. Again, we're told this is not a problem, um, but we wonder if, in fact, it's going to prove to be a problem, and we certainly deserve full disclosure on what foods and products might be modified. Here's one a little closer to home, something developed in Summerland, British Columbia, near my hometown, browning-resistant apples. So now you can pre-slice them, put them in salad bars, and they don't turn brown as fast. Food to you looks fresh, but now your senses are deceived because it's not as fresh. This one just doesn't brown the way you would expect it to. Is that bad? You know, tend to think nutritional content might slump the larger less something is left out. It's going to be more and more challenging for us to um, distinguish these things on our own. Harmful or not, people don't like the idea of genetically modified. So here's a food label of a soya drink that's available in our doctor's lounge at our hospital. And here it says, non-GMO verified. Why? Because it's bad for you? No, because people want that and they're willing to pay more for it. So here's a nice article in the Wall Street Journal from last February. GMO-free crops are lucrative for farmers. You know, it used to be all we had was GMO-free crops. Now we have GMOs that was supposed to be good for us. Now they're selling us the original thing at a higher price, so we're paying more for what used to be the only thing available. That's a nice twist. Whether it's harmful or not, um, people tend not to want it, and farmers are cashing in. So you have to be happy for them, I guess, in some ways. Uh, now, here's another interesting article. You know, a very popular food line in the, in the United States is chipotles. So they said, um, we're going to stop using genetically altered ingredients altogether, and everyone's going to know that. Anything you buy from us doesn't have anything genetically modified. And the um, chief executive officer, the founder, says, just because food is served fast doesn't mean it has to be made with cheap, raw ingredients, highly processed with preservatives and fillers and stabilizers and artificial colors and flavors. Love it. Just love it that they have that um, philosophy, and that's going to make me think more favorably about them for sure. And one of those things they've eliminated is GMOs, and we'll pay more for them eliminating GMOs um, whether they are harmful or not, it's certainly true that people are willing to pay more at this point in time um, not to eat them. And that's going to be driving up um, pr prices for many of us. We're moving along uh, really great with our time. We're going to finish on time today. You've been really good. I didn't offer people a stretch. I feel bad because we've been sitting a long time. So if you'd like, just take a minute to stretch. Stand up if you'd like. I'll, it's kind of the seventh inning, you know, this isn't halfway, when the game's halfway over, we're in the seventh inning out of nine, we really are. Um, you know, but we want those, um, we want to knock it out of the park in those last two innings. And uh, I really appreciate everyone, everyone being so um, attentive here. So pesticides. Pesticides are on our fruits and vegetables and we don't want to eat these. How do we avoid them? We've, t we've said it before, buy organic, whenever you can, shop local farmer's market, avoid the mass produced, and always clean your fruits and vegetables. So here's an interesting result from um, this article. People who often or always buy organic produce were found to have significantly less organophosphate insecticides in their system even though they reported eating 70% more fruits and vegetables daily than other adults who rarely or never purchase organic produce. So people who are eating non-organic 
are being found to have higher levels of very toxic pesticides actually in their system, meaning it got from the fruit into their bodies and it's accumulating in their blood. That's scary. You know, organic's expensive. Um, we can be very diligent about washing our fruits and vegetables, but let's be aware that these things are happening and um, being measured in people. What's organophosphate tech? Um, toxicity. It affects neurotransmitters. It gives you headaches, nausea, nausea and dizziness, sweating, salivation, um, tearing, muscle twitches, weakness, abdominal cramps, vomiting, diarrhea. Obviously, this man is at much higher risk than the rest of us eating it in the grocery store, but even small traces of this are going to um, degrade the quality of our health. So, 12 most pesticide-containing fruits and vegetables. Buyer beware. We're going to go from lowest to highest, so the winner is last. Um, apples, 99% of apples have at least one pesticide residue. Peaches, 98%. Nectarines, 97%. Got to wash, folks. I mean, our, our instinct is, oh, that looks so good, that looks so healthy, let's just take it and eat it, this is good for me, I'm benefiting. And that should be all your instincts need to tell you, because they're good but we have to be more sophisticated because the food manufacturers are becoming more food sophisticated and we have to take care of ourselves. Strawberries, 13 pesticides in a sample. Grapes, 15. Sweet bell peppers, 15. Cherry tomatoes, 13. Peas, 13. Celery, sixth on the dirty dozen list. Spinach, seventh. Cucumbers, ninth. Potatoes, most pesticides by weight. Got to wash them, folks. Collard greens, 41. Kale, 51 pesticides. Hot peppers, almost too many to count. The onus is on us. Six ways to minimize your exposure. Buy organic. Grow your own produce. And this article says a 400-square-foot backyard plot can provide and produce enough for a family of four. So even a small garden, grow your own, can move you a long way in the direction of freeing yourself from um, some of these exposures. Use non-toxic methods to control insects in your own home and garden. The chemicals we're using are often more toxic and dangerous than the bugs we're trying to kill. Um, something to explore is this business of diatomaceous earth, which can kill many common indoor insects. Have a no-shoes policy in your floor. That lawn's been treated with chemical fertilizer and herbicides. You track across it, bring it in your house. It can live in your car for years longer. And um, you'll have that ongoing exposure, exposure. Blanching and peeling, especially with meats. If you're eating meats, trim off that excess fat and skin. It's probably got unwanted um, pesticide residues within it. How about washing? I don't like to wash things. Um, it turns out it's not that hard. Wash with cold, warm, or salt. A cold water washing probably removes 75 to 80 percent of your pesticide residues. Add 2 percent salt wash, salt water that will remove most. A warm water rinse takes care of most of what's left over. If you want to use a little tablespoon of your detergent um, to wash your fruits and vegetables, that can be excellent also. And then there's a, for a few commercially available washes if you want to go that route. But really, cold water, um, warm water, salt water, or a 10% vinegar soak, you know, can be just excellent from, um, you know, removing those pesticide residues from our fruits and vegetables. And um, really is, you know, worth that extra effort. We all need to be aware we're living with a certain amount of air pollution and other pollution exposures. Here's an expert position paper on air pollution and cardiovascular risk. So this is a study of active um, research and obviously an important product problem. 6% of all-cause, all-age deaths are attributed to ambient air pollution. 3.1% of disability-adjusted life years lost to air pollution. It's a modifiable risk factor. Cardiovascular disease is due to oxidative stress and systemic inflammation resulting from pesticide exposure, or sorry, pollution exposure. So I lived in downtown Montreal for years, 10 years. Um, there's what the all air quality can look on certain days. And, um, you know, much better for all of those of you who live here in nice, natural, beautiful, pristine Vancouver, which can also have its smog problems and, you know, you're being subjected to um, 
toxicity from the air pollution which we do find around us. Most exposure, in fact, occurs indoors. Western societies spend 90% of their time indoors. I'm on the high end of that number, I can assure you. So outdoor air pollution gets into our buildings and it circulates through our um, air circulating system and actually concentrates in the building to a certain extent. And most of our exposures can occur indoors. We think of um, particles of less than 2.5 microns or less than 10 microns. Obviously the very finest particles are the ones that are the most difficult to um, filter out and let's be aware that we're exposed to them. We're doing fossil fuel conduct combustion, and even if we're not, there's secondary pollutants being formed in the atmosphere all around us, and it doesn't matter where you live. Ozone is um, being formed by unavoidable processes in our atmosphere. And you say, well, I thought the ozone was good because it blocks the, blocks the sun. It is good if it just stayed way up there in the stratosphere, um, but it doesn't. It's down here, uh, and it's all around us, and there is some toxicity to that. You know, here's several other places I've called home, very dearly New York City, and um, that's indeed what it can look like um, from the ground or say the top of the um, Empire State Building, and even you know, Los Angeles is, um, can be just a disaster as well. And let's be aware that these things are um, causing us diseases, confirmed heart failure, stroke, ischemic heart disease, probably arrhythmias, peripheral artery disease, venous thromboembolism, the effect is real and it's taking its toll. What can we do? We can walk, cycle, take public transport, avoid inefficient burning, don't be exercising next to high traffic or during rush hour traffic. You know, so pick your time. Make sure you make it into the parks and gardens if you, have, if you do live in the cities. Limit time outdoors during high pollution, so be judicious about what's going on out there. We can add ventilation systems in our homes with proper filtration so that the air that's in our homes that we breathe most of the time is in fact clean. So our, there are things we can do, but we have to be proactive and deliberate about it because these exposures are coming at us whether we like it or not, and they will affect our health over time and likely limit our longevity ultimately. We have, the, uh, we have a few more minutes, we have food additives. The food industry is far more sophisticated than any one of us, and they're far better at producing things for us to consume than probably most of us imagine, and they're very good at disguising their processes not always listing on their labels what's actually in the food, using words that are misleading and very comforting to us, like it's flour or it's protein or it was natural. Um, potentially very deceptive. You want to buy some washed and ready-to-eat salad because you don't have time to make dinner? That might have been cleaned by sloshing around in tap water that was dosed with chlorine used for eight hours to treat other fruits and vegetables covered with pesticides and toxic residues before it washed yours. And here it is, pristine, ready for your consumption. You know, be careful. Enzymes, nice tender meat. Well, maybe that animal was injected with some tenderizing, meat-consuming enzyme before it was slaughtered. You love that nice, soft, fresh bread. Maybe that was treated with some additive. The food you eat has added vitamins, so it's fortified. Those can be factory versions of natural vitamins. Um, they're not what's found in whole food, and they're not nearly as good for you, if at all. Vitamin C is a fermentation product of, of GM corn. Vitamin E is a common derivative in petrol. Companies can get a hold of this, add this stuff, it improves their labeling, doesn't necessarily improve your health. Again, if you want to avoid, plant-based, whole food, wash your own. Mature cheese used to take months to mature. Now we can do it in 72 hours using certain additives. Is that good for you? You know, probably not. Uh, certainly deceptive because you thought you were buying very mature uh, cheese. In fact, it didn't take any longer to make than the unmature cheese. Um, processed meats. What about all the animal remnants that didn't go into the high quality meats? Well, those can be processed into a powder and added to low grade meats. It adds protein. So what can we do? Increase the protein on the label. You think you're benefiting more because wow, I'm getting an excellent source of protein from this processed food. You know, 
Thank goodness for modern science, it's so good for me. You know, be very suspicious, appropriately suspicious. Emulsifiers, detergent-like molecules are abundant on processed foods. They give stability and consistency to ice cream or chocolate. These detergents can start to degrade the mucosa in your gut, which is separating your actual gut wall from the billions of bacteria that are in there living with you, giving them access to your gut wall where they can promote inflammation, even result in uncontrolled, ongoing, smoldering inflammation of irritable bowel disease. So now you have abdominal pain, diarrhea, fatigue. You have another inflammatory process, which is degrading the quality of the other organs and tissues throughout your body maybe because of your exposure to processed foods. So we have to be careful, and the onus is um, really on us to, to select wisely at, um, at every turn. We're getting a little bit low on time. I had gone further into food additives. I'll just say we need to be a master of our labels. The more things on the label, the less good it is for you. Be aware that most food labels exist because they have to warn you about something that they didn't wish they have to warn you about. That's why the label's there. It's um, usually the case, not there to um, extol the virtues of everything that's in your product um, or, what you're, or what you're purchasing. So sodium nitrates, um, additives like BHA, BHT, Trans fats, we've talked at length about trans fats. Um, again, something we need to avoid. Synthetic fats or fake fats like Olestra. Uh, these things are not good for us. We think we're um, stealing home base by not ingesting fats. It's um, something to avoid. Propylgallate, you'll find on labels. Monosodium glutamate, bad for you. Mainly rat studies, but this is severely toxic to rats, and to think that we're so much better than the rats is um, probably a stretch, even though the proof isn't quite there for toxicity necessarily in humans. So this was previously most Asian foods and junk foods. It is now plentiful even in fine dining restaurants. So the chances that MSG has been added as a flavor enhancement to processed foods or prepared foods that you're buying is substantial, and it is probably not good for you. Um, potassium bromate, artificial sweeteners, aspartame. They sell this yogurt in our physician's lounge at my hospital. That one I won't touch. I will use the Greek yogurt. I wish all I had to know was that some yogurt sometime was good for you, but we have to be just a little bit better than that and um, pay attention to the labels and the fine details about what we're taking in. Artificial coloring. I remember as a kid, these were everywhere, and um, you know we're supposed to make food so interesting. Really significant um, toxicities from tumors in animals to psychiatric illnesses in children you know, all as a trade-off for a little bit of color to try to make our foods more interesting. We just have to avoid these things and go back to our principle of if it's not a whole food, if it's not plant-based, and if we didn't have the chance to really wash it, we're just not gonna eat it. And uh, those simple principles will um, really take us a long time, but it's nice to know at least once that we review what all these toxic exposures are that we're at risk for so that we can, in an intelligent way, know why we are um, avoiding certain food additives and in an informed way know what is being sold to us and what we are um, deliberately avoiding. You know, we talked extensively about white sugar. White sugar is simply not a food additive that, um, that we can tolerate. Uh, moving along very quickly, and we have a few more minutes, I promise a good chance to move out and stretch before um, the next presentation starts. Let's cover these quick because this is important too. Heavy metal. We're all exposed to heavy metal. Do you like heavy metal? Well, it, you shouldn't like heavy metal because heavy metal is not good for you. Um, mercury. It's an element on your periodic table. Mercury contaminated air, fish, dental fillings, and even some vaccines um, historically. Even a drop of mercury can contaminate a 20-acre lake. Concentrates in ocean beds, 
the small fish get their first exposure, and by the time you're to the big fish, there's a lot of exposure, and by the time you eat the big fish, you're already um, at risk for mercury contamination and toxicity, and this stuff is nasty. Cardiovascular system, the immune system, the nervous system, very sensitive. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, five times the mercury levels, and this is just very interesting to me, in some studies, an idiopathic cardiomyopathy, and I get this, someone comes into our cardiology clinic, we do the ultrasound of their heart, and the function is low. Arteries are not blocked. It could be a myriad of causes. You just try to deal with what's in front of you. In certain studies, 22,000-fold mercury levels in those hearts with severe, um, you know, cardiomyopathy. It's astounding what could be, um, you know, unfortunately killing certain people in our society who have no idea what they're dying from. Mercury blocks enzymes, it inactivates antioxidants. Um, interestingly, selenium is necessary and has the potential to neutralize mercury. Where do you get selenium? You get selenium in your Brazil nuts. So back to that principle of eating mixed nuts. And I look for a mixed nut that contains a Brazil nut. So every couple of days I know I'm eating one of those. So I just grab a handful kind of, um, you know, most days. And already you're protecting yourself in a natural way against some of these exposures, which we've all probably had and could be suffering from, and is just really um, so hard to combat. So mercury levels rising in parallel with autism risk, possibly causative. Um, it's, ex it, it's scary what industrial exposures have pumped into our natural reservoirs are exposing us far beyond the interests and for a long, far longer time than the industrial interests um, persist and continue to affect us. Is this responsible for autism in children, Alzheimer's in young folks? Often the symptoms of exposure and poisoning and toxicities are strikingly similar. Hard to prove, you only get one chance. Protect yourself, because these things could be um, very detrimental to your health and devastating to your quality of health in advanced years. Lead, a billion tons of lead is mined annually. Lead emissions from, industrial, from industry pollute food and water. 90% of the body's lead collects in your bones and it gets locked in your bones. Bone lead content is 100 times greater now than it was 100 years ago because so much lead has been dredged out of our land and is um, you know, spread all over our living environments. Interestingly, and this is a very interesting concept, is that bone mineral density is relatively static in healthy men and premenopausal women, but during those years, lead content could be increasing such that in elderly years, when we start to become osteoporotic, those bones which are contracting, demineralizing to a certain degree, are then releasing mercury that's been stored into our body, into our circulation, and hastening the aging process. So the exposures you thought you got away with your entire life could come back and catch up to you later on when osteoporosis starts to um, set in and become one of your issues. So it's an interesting hypothesis and it's not proven, I don't think, but it's really cause for pause that age can be thought of as representing your duration of heavy metal exposure and that effect may only start to manifest later on in life and may be responsible for some age-related conditions or what we think is just simply age-related, high blood pressure, um, cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease could in fact um, represent to a certain degree heavy metal toxicity. What we do for acute heavy metal toxicity is chelation therapy. Um, certain compounds that can mop up and soak those heavy metals um, um, out of your tissues. Here is a trial to assess chelation therapy. So a medical trial to really assess the benefits of chelation therapy in patients with cardiovascular risk and the study was simply not conclusive to show benefit. So we couldn't prove that with a certain chelation regimen, mopping things out of people who probably were significantly at risk and had exposure that
really truly benefited them. So it doesn't become a routine um, recommendation to do chelation. A heavy metal solution that may be available to us is the possibility of chlorella as a supplement. And this is something I'm exploring myself and considering taking myself as an over-the-counter um, product is that chlorella, a form of blue-green algae, has this fibrous outer shell, inner nutrients that can be a powerful detox for heavy metals when you are taking it on intervals longer than three to six months. Again, I'm not convinced yet. I'm not recommending it to anybody. Just like you to think about the possibility of heavy metal exposure that you've had throughout your lifetime and the consequences that may have to your health later on in life. And be aware that there may be steps that you can take even late in life to mitigate the effects of that early exposure. And this may be um, one of them and one of the safest ones. We won't know how effective it is because it's not gonna get studied anytime soon in a randomized trial. Um, nevertheless, the concept and potentially the data for it is, um, or sorry, the, the, the um, proof of concept data at least is compelling and, um, and um, something perhaps worth considering. Wild salmon versus farm salmon. Farm salmon, absolutely not, especially if it is on the Atlantic. These are very unhealthy organisms, um, very s probably quite sick fish, fair amount of toxic exposures. The meat is pink because it's been treated with chemicals to make it pink, to make it appealing to you. This is not healthy stuff. When we say eat fish, you have to be aware of the source. Pacific, at a minimum, Atlantic, or sorry, um, Alaskan, even better. You know, the simple thing for the vegetarians say, I'm not even gonna eat, eat um, fish. And that may be safe because of um, the mercury and pollution content that are in, in um, some of these very unfortunate creatures. Um, but just be aware, where is the fish that you might be buying and eating coming from? And what might be the effects of having a farm fish source? Tap water, there's arsenic in our groundwater, there's barium in our groundwater. Um, tap water, we absolutely have to filter tap water, any tap water that we're drinking, even over-the-counter um, filters that you can buy at your grocery store can be very effective in removing many of the toxic elements that could be present in your tap water, uh, so stick to it. And um, be cautious with the water you avo uh, buy. Avoid distilled water because that's also taken out many of the beneficial minerals that are in um, regular water, hard water that your body is relying on. Be careful about the plastic that you buy your water in. These one gallon PVCs or containers like this, um, typically not the best. These are better provided they weren't heated. Heated in your car or on the back of the delivery truck, which you don't know about. Um, so be very careful. Tap water through an adequate filter, um, you know, or a bot source such as Culligan water, um, I think are really your best options. Um, just be aware and um, be very careful about what, you're, um, about what you're taking into your body. Again, to summarize, and we are on time, the buzzword is whole food, plant-based diet with organic sources when possible. In all cases, organic or not, we wanna wash properly. Cold water, warm water, a little vinegar, a little salt, wash properly. Drink filtered water. You can filter it with your own handheld filter in your kitchen, but try to drink filtered water, not water um, straight out of your tap. Be aware of um, pollution and industrial exposures and um, really take what steps you feel you can to protect yourself. Again, we'll have this on our website. If you're so kind, go put in an email address and I will make these lectures available on YouTube and the notes available. The slides have a lot of information. You can go back and um, review it, think about it on your own time and um, hopefully really start to tailor and tweak your life to um, have the best chance of, of long-term success that is um, you know, possible in the world we live in today. Thank you again very much for your attention. I've re really very much enjoyed myself.